aspirational hero. 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 Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Aspirational. So the aspirational heroes need to be there. They need to be pure, 100% from the beginning. They need to be at that unattainable goal of perfection and good, and hopeful and inspirational and all of that. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that aspirational. Move that ass. Move that ass. Move that ass. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another Office Hours live stream. Hopefully you had a good week. Hopefully my audio is coming through nice and clear today. No problems or issues there. Looks like the video is coming through well. Yeah, I don't know why the uh had some audio issues last week, but it looks like they're done gone now. I'm sure I hear a knock from my dear sound engraver if uh if <laughs> if they are present. Hopefully you guys are doing well. I uh, It's been a week. Good week, but a busy week. I am officially on spring break, which I'm very excited about. I still have some work to do, but not as much. So I'm very happy to be here celebrating that with you guys. Uh, I know I say this every week, but I, I, I do have topics that I want to talk about, and, and I, I hope they make sense. We'll see. If, if I can string them together in any kind of coherent way. Sometimes office hours is my way of kind of, uh, you know, working through the ideas that I've been thinking about, you know, just kind of talking through some of the things that I've been trying to link together and, and process. And if it sounds good, then I'll either re-record it as its own video or cut it out and edit them together as a bit of a video. So, but welcome to you guys. Let's see who all was here first. Ghost Planet Max Inc. 1.0, of course, here first. Great to see you. Private Eye in Retrospectiva, welcome. Nathaniel Zalozbal, Darth Enigma, the Imaginative Hobbyist, Stunning and Brave Megatron, welcome, welcome. Eldritch Fan, good to see you. My dear Sound Engraver, of course. Big Al Presents popping in to say hello. Good to see you there. Um, let's see. Eldritch Fan talking about Star Wars, the Supernatural Encounters set. I haven't heard of that one. I'll have to look that up. As you know, I'm still getting through a lot of the EU uh, for the first time, which is so wonderful. But I will look that up. You say uh, it's good before Disney gobbles it up. Yeah, who knows? Or rewrites it or something. Who knows? But uh, good to hear that. Auditor Dread talking about uh, took you some time, but you rebought. Let me go back on StreamYard here so I can actually actually post comments I'm talking about. Uh, took some time, but I rebought my old EU. Star Wars collection. I'd given up on Star Wars shortly after The Last Jedi, but after your EU analysis, I decided to go back. Cheers. Thank you, sir. Cheers to you. I really appreciate hearing that and appreciate you telling me that. That's good news. That's what I like to hear. Because I get it. It is easy to be just uh, completely discouraged, right? It's so easy. Get this mic cord out of my way. It's so easy to get really discouraged and. Uh, you know, I understand it. Fan Man talks a lot about, you know, this is kind of his take on things where he he can't even bring himself to watch the classic Star Wars trilogy. He can't even bring himself, he's a, a Star Trek Next Gen fan, and he can't even bring himself to watch Star Trek Next Gen anymore because of what people have done to it. I really disagree with that. I think that's kind of like, that's where they win, you know? I mean, I totally get where he's coming from, and I sympathize and empathize with him because it really, it really, when the culture around you has just uh, gone full on, trying to discredit and deconstruct and remake in hindsight the franchises that you loved and so many supposed fans i mean again I don't, i'm not a next gen fan so i never really had a, a dog in the hunt as they say when the star trek next generation or picard series and all that came out i knew it was crap you know picard because it you know it was just politics as usual but so many um 
Star Trek fans around us that were usually right there with us fighting the the two woke fight and stuff like that. We're just like, actually, guys, actually, season two got pretty good, you know. So they were watching it and gobbling it up, and and I can see how it would be hard. I don't know. I I, I can easily disconnect it though. I will never. They will never take away from me the classics that that we had back in the day. Uh, that doesn't matter how much Disney wants to rewrite continuity and all of whatever their BS nonsense, they will never take away from me the original Star Wars trilogy, the glorious EU, um, you know, and so forth with all the other franchises as well. They'll never take that away from me. Even the MCU. I can still watch the, the first part of the MCU, which I think was glorious. I know some people checked out of it or whatever for this or that reason, but, man, I mean, you you... As far as I'm concerned, you can't get better than the first Captain America movie or that first Avengers film. I thought that was wonderful, you know, and uh, I'll never I, I don't I can still watch those movies and not think about them is definitely leading towards, you know, Endgame and the whole Marvel nonsense that came after it and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I know that, that that's it's a wound that needs time to heal for some people. So it's nice to know that you would audit your auditor dread at least were able to return to the great EU books. Appreciate hearing that. Uh, got off on a little tangent there. I might do some tangents today. So you guys have questions or whatnot, you know, you throw them out there and see if I can get to them and stuff. But uh, Thaniel's Lisboa said you, you've been reading Outbound Flight. Uh, had to stop at Chapter 16. You bought a misprint copy with, with passages from another book. Really? Oh, Republic Commando. Interesting. I don't think that's ever happened to me before, buying a book that has copies of another book in it. But, uh, yep. Uh, welcome to everybody else. I could sit here all day and just call out everybody in the in the chat, but it's good to see you all. So, I was thinking about this topic today. You know, I, I think about a lot of, uh, you know, archetypes are my scholarship. And looking at our modern-day mythologies and how they operate how they they affect us uh individually psychologically as i always say and also as a culture um you know in society and i noticed that there are um oh, let me get the super chat first before i dig into it too much uh divinity alkayan thank you so much for the super chat ten dollars thank you there hard day so i need to veg offering this comment to say i stopped by and will re-watch later oh well great to see you divinity alkayan thanks for dropping by and thanks for the the super chat i hope it's worthy of a rewatch later for you uh, it'll be here for you, so hopefully it, it entertains you. And um, But hopefully you go get a good veg on. I know what it's like to need some vegging. I'm going to do that myself later, definitely. Uh, so thank you for that. So thinking about culture and, and archetypes, and this is archetypes are one of the ways that mythology affects culture because if you trace the idea of archetypes back through Joseph Campbell, through Carl Jung, you know, you can go all the way back. I mean, heck, you can go all the way back to platonic forms in a certain matter if you want to but it's um this is how you can identify parts of stories through archetypes that really resonate with the human experience and have throughout history and different cultures and so forth and it's it's ways to identify parts of the human psyche and the human experience that that come across in stories over and over so i look at that a lot but then i also think a lot about how society at different times needs certain archetypes more than others at different times, depending on what's going on in societies, and sometimes it's somewhat cyclical. It's true. So as an example, I've got the Superman playing back behind me and stuff like that. Um, I'll use Superman as an example. You know, in the late 70s there, well, even before that, let's let's go back to Superman's creation, okay? Uh, being created at the, at the end of the, the uh, Depression era, so we people needed an escape. People needed hope. And even though Superman wasn't created straight out of the box, as we've said, as the, the truth, justice, and the American way, all of the DNA for the character was there. And he was created as that great escape that, you know, and people responded to it. And, of course, with the radio shows, with the, the Fleischer animations and so forth, he very soon, very quickly became our, our iconic Superman of the truth, justice, and the American way that we know and love and stayed that way for decades. I mean, practically a century almost a century, before, again, uh, DC started to try to mandate editorial changes, and then uh, 
a bunch of idiots in Hollywood and Warner Brothers decided to try to change things up, Zack Snyder and so forth. But he was he came about at a time when when history needed him. And then you look at his history and you see certain incarnations that really stuck in culture, you know, going all the way back, you know, uh, we, we look, we're not going to cut into every, every historical era, but certainly George Reeves is incarnation of the character on television in the fifties. I mean, this is after world war two. So we really need some hope. We really need just, just to look up and see a, a brighter tomorrow, you know, in the late seventies when the Christopher Reeve film, you know, the Richard Donner film with Christopher Reeve first came out. This was wonderful because now you, the late seventies were a time. If you look at the the types of media that came out, the American culture really needed uh, they needed some optimism. They needed you know we're going into the eighties and there was a lot of optimism you know for the eighties. You know we we're hoping things would be better, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you were on. And we needed a lot of hope. You know the the sixties and even early seventies had given us a lot of. Uh, discontent with the government again earned or unearned however you see it or whatever but but media hollywood reflected that so you had a lot of um you know more dire more more um bleak you know even george lucas himself his first movie was very bleak you know and, and it was a conscious choice for him to turn around and do star wars which is something that was going to bring hope and be the hero's journey and so forth so you know in the late 70s there you had you had star wars you had superman you had a bunch of other movies in the start of franchises that really just stuck with culture and and, and uh, blossomed into staples for decades up, uh, after that. It's interesting, Superman, right before 9-11, so the right, you know, 2000, what was 9-11, 2002? I always get the numbers wrong. But uh, right before 9-11, a little bit before that, they were actually working on the development for the series Smallville on the the WB is what it was called before it changed to the CW. And a lot of critics, TV critics and whatnot, and a lot of people just talking about it in general in Hollywood or on the, you know, I guess bulletin boards or forums, you know, whatever incarnation of the internet, you know, was it had back then. A lot of people were saying, this is ridiculous. A super, aren't we past this little goody two shoe mom and pop shop? American apple pie, you know, this is ridiculous. Why would you be telling a story about this? Because the story, too, was not a Superman story in space or anything like that, but Clark Kent when he was just growing up in Smallville. You know, Smallville, really focusing on where he got all of these homespun values, you know, America, middle America values, you know, that made him the American way, truth, justice, and the American way. So a lot of people are thinking, what in the world? Why would you even develop something like this now? This is ridiculous. And you think about what was going on at the culture. You know, turn of the century, there was just the the scare of two thousand of that. There was the um, you know, the the election when George W. Bush first came into office. You know, a lot of people were contesting that, and uh, there was all kind of discontent about this or that. Then nine eleven happened, and you know, a lot of people, even those of us who lived through it. It can it can be a little hard to remember sometimes because there was such a eventually there was such a visceral push in culture against the Bush administration and the the war on terror you know and all this kind of stuff you know especially from the woke Hollywood or or liberal Hollywood however you want to say it you know it applied back then but um, it it can be hard to remember that there was an immense swelling of patriotism and and across the lines we are one as America you know right after nine eleven which didn't last comparatively long is, is the, the backlash eventually that came after, but it was very strong and it was very uh, formational in a lot of ways. And overnight, overnight, the response to this Smallville show became, oh my gosh, we need this. We need this so bad right now. We need a good, you know, wholesome series. Superman, come back and save us again. Our culture needs you again, you know? And uh, in Smallville, of course, it, you know, I still think it's a great show. It has a lot of problems, of course. It's a, it's a teeny bopper melodrama you know that's the genre of it you know that sort of weekly cw kind of teeny bopper thing but they really did respect the heart of superman they they really respect the donner years they they pull i mean yeah the show went on too long and so forth we can speak and pick it apart all day but at the end of the day if you're a superman fan it's darn fun to watch and a lot of those episodes are just classic you know and great casting you know so i i i really like the show quite a bit you know for what it was I think it could have been a lot worse. And I think it was really great that they respected the franchise and the character so much. 
you know, similar to like Lois and Clark before that, you know, again, um, a very different type of genre for the show and for the franchise, you know, 90s kind of um, primetime L.A. Law-ish kind of, you know, uh, take on it. But wonderful, wonderful. And, you know, yeah, yeah, you might have had to put up with Superman not having the spit curl or whatever, whatever. It was still really good. Um, And that's not the case with incarnations lately. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so post 9-11, it was about time for another Superman movie, especially in 2009 when Superman Returns came out. I think it was 2009. In 2000, uh, or Superman Returns, I will, I will never stop saying, yes, it, was a, it made horrible choices as a Superman movie. It was the absolute, unquestioned, wrong direction to go for a Superman movie. There are things in that movie that are unforgivable for being a Superman movie, 100%. That being said, it is a very well done, artistically made film. And there are wonderful, iconic, amazing Superman moments about it. Uh, You know, you never want to have a story where Superman just left Earth. You know, you'd you'd have to do a lot more than that movie did to really justify anything like that. But being that he did leave Earth and he came back, that scene, you know, after he, you know, catches the airplane, that was all amazing and everything. But landing in that baseball diamond with uh, people, and, and they, there's a moment, you know, when he catches the plane, sets it down, and he goes inside to see if everybody's out, and he comes back out, and he's staring at everybody, and there's that moment of, okay, is he going to be accepted again? Because this is a very different world. The movie doesn't mention 9-11, but this is a post-9-11 America now, and, and the in the film, even, he's been gone for so many years or whatever, and there's that moment where there's silence, and it is, can we still... Can we still believe in hope like we once did as a culture? You know, that's one of the things that the movie asks, one of the questions. And uh, and there's that moment. And then in, in, in no time at all, the whole stadium just erupts in cheers. Yes, we desperately, thank you for returning. We needed you. We needed hope. We needed our Superman. We, this is our hero. He's back to save us. We need hope. And, and it was a wonderful thing. You know, again, for all the problems in that movie, it had some really amazing scenes like that that just really got it, you know. And uh, and that was great. But, you know, of course, the film dropped the ball in a lot of ways. So, you know, it wasn't the, the real return of Superman to our culture that we needed. And then fast forward a few years more and you get, pardon my French, Zach Dumbass Snyder. I just, you know, I, I have no patience for people who try to defend this man and the 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 assassination that he perpetuated on Superman as a character, as a, as a mythological, you know, uh, it, it's just it's it's ridiculous what he did. And you can you can you can look at scenes from his garbage movies that he put a you know, character he called Superman in and see the public's reaction. And and that's that's that's, that's a nihilistic take on it. No, but you know some people really liked him in, in Superman or in Batman v Superman, did they? I mean, I know that we're supposed to believe they did, and that's part of, like, the problem, you know, or whatever. No, even the people that were supposedly liking him were, like, just, like, they were, like, uh, Stockholm Syndrome, you know, kind of uh, people. They just, like, they were so shocked and, and, and devoid of all emotion from their, their circumstances. They just reached out to this one guy that they thought might be able to help them, maybe. I mean, it's just, it's, it's awful. It was awful. Everything about that film was awful. Deconstructed the snot out of Superman. It is encouraging to see the fact that that universe finally did just die. The Snyderverse is gone, folks. It'll never come back. The Snyder bros are still, still, you know, knuckle-dragging around trying to make a, a hoo-ha about it or whatever, but it's just not coming. It's not coming back, and it never will, and good riddance to it. It needs to die and forever be forgotten. Because of that, though, because that, it, you know, it... it muddied up Superman so much and we desperately needed that Paragon archetype, you know, because that's what Superman is. He's the aspirational hero and he's our Paragon. He's the aspirational Paragon. You need aspirational Paragons in culture. And we went through a time where people were just trying to tear down our aspirational Paragons one after the other, you know, whether it's Optimus Prime or He-Man or Superman, um, Luke Skywalker, you know, whatever Paragon you tend to resonate with most, uh, chances are they were trying to tear them down at one point and deconstruct them. So now we're seeing a lot of people just willing to settle for any incarnation that seemingly gives us 
that aspect of Superman back, his hopefulness, his ability to come in and save. And so people are always, and I'll come back to these in a moment, but people are always trying to tell me, no, prof, you're wrong about my adventures with Superman. You're wrong about Superman and Lois. Those are actually really... Because they see steps in the right direction. Admittedly, they see really great steps in the right direction from those incarnations. And suddenly that's they're willing to, you know, throw it all down. It's like, these are the people that, you know, if Superman Returns came out today instead of back then, they'd be all in on it because, you know, whatever, problems aside, you know, they're just, they're willing to, to take what they can get at this point, which I understand to a certain degree because we need Superman back so badly. And again, I'm going to go into, there's another aspect of this that I'm going to round this out with here in a second. But, um, you know, we, we don't know yet, even though I don't have, I have zero faith in James Gunn as a Superman storyteller. It's not the franchise for him. He said the most idiotic things about it already. There's zero faith in him for that. But we don't know, right? Who knows? Uh, you know, what if it came out and was great? Maybe. But the thing is, like, people are just, I just see everybody willing to settle. So it's gotten to the point where it doesn't matter what kind of Superman film it is. I already know people are going to go champion it as the next great thing. Um, even though some of the, the silly signs have come in the in the casting already. For a lot of the casting is pretty great. But you'll never, ever see a white Perry White again. You'll never see a white Jimmy Olsen again. Um, now, is that a bad thing? Is that is that a deal breaker in and of itself? Like, a, does, does Jimmy Olsen or, or Perry White have to be white? Not necessarily. But those little changes are part of a bigger agenda. And it's part of a little, it's part of just turning the heat up, the frog in the pot, just slowly turning the heat up. Well, hey, look. There's nothing objectionably wrong with a little salt in the water. What's wrong? Hey, it's actually good for your skin. So just, you know, sh take that. It's okay. There's no, hey, don't be silly. You can't just object to me putting a little bit of spices in the water you're in. There's nothing, you know, objectively wrong with that. So, okay, so we're okay with that. Okay, yeah, sh Okay, look over there. Well, I turned the heat up just a little bit more. You know, that that's what it is. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. Let me get a couple super chats before I continue to this other aspect of it. Studio, thank you, uh, Studio 90, I'm sorry, my eyes, Studio 9G Films, oh, I should have looked at it over there, Studio 96 Films, sorry, it looks so different on the screen there, Studio 96 Films, uh, recent, thank you for this 499 Super Chat, recently he came out and said, Batman being a killer is now, you make him, re is how you make him relevant, and after all this time, he still doesn't get it, no, Zack Snyder still doesn't get it, uh, it's glorious to see him fail at everything he does now. I love the fact that his not Star Wars from Netflix is just like, even the Snyder Bros can't really get behind that and and uh, defend that. It's just it's become blatantly obvious now that the man is not a storyteller. He can't tell stories. He's a visual artist, and if you like that kind of aesthetic, then I'm sure you love the look of his films. But he's only ever been successful when he was dealing with a script from an already very tight story. You know, uh, something like. Um, 300 or, or whatever you know that kind of thing but uh but yeah thank you for pointing that out appreciate the super chat there um eldritch fam 999 thank you so much there so i've been watching vids of the batman the animated series creators they said they weren't bound by comic canon and cherry picked the best they ended up reinventing characters like two-face and mr freeze for the better yeah and the series of course created harley quinn and the thing about that is I'm glad you point that out because, you know, people always try and tell me when I talk about the problems with the Snyderverse or something. Oh, but Professor, you know, you know that in the comics, Superman killed once too, right? I mean, that's, you, that's not your, that's not your, just as you say, as you point out to or as you allude to the Eldritch fan, that's not the canon. That's not the, the measure by which you call the iconic nature of these characters. You don't just point at the comics and if it happened once in the comics, then it was great. A lot of writers did a lot of stupid things with Superman in the comics. Just because it was in the comics once doesn't make it part of the iconic character. What makes it part of the iconic character is things that have been tried that stuck, that culture said yes to. So like when the change came for Superman to actually fly instead of just leap tall buildings in a single bound, that worked. People accepted that. That became part of the character. You know, when... um. When John Byrne created, and this isn't even, John Byrne did some stupid things. He also did some glorious things, but this is sort of a in-between, like whatever. He had a thing in his run where if a cloth was against Superman's skin, it couldn't be cut. So that's how his suit would survive 
all these things. His cape could be in tatters because that was floating off of him. But if a, if a cloth was next to his skin, it couldn't be cut. I mean, you know, points for creativity, but that's kind of silly. Just just make the cloth from the ship, you know, and, and make it sort of a Kryptonian nature too or something, you know. Um, you know, so little little things like that don't survive, some do. And, yeah, you're right. The um, creator, you know, Bruce Tim, Paul Dini, um, Alan Barnett, and so forth, they, they did pick. Now, the, the thing is that they had strong writers on that show. It used to be that we thought Bruce Tim was the – he was the – he was the genius behind that show. He was the one who gave us these what such iconic portrayals of these characters, and that's it's just come to light that no, that's not the case at all. Bruce Tim was willing to sell out these characters in a heartbeat. He'd he'd crap all over them as he tried to do many many times when he came back to the animated universe and tried to make all these stupid movies. Um, Paul Dini, I think, was really the saving grace, and maybe some other writers who were there too that that really kept these characters going. I mean, Paul Dini is behind the great. Uh, I think Mr. Freeze and Two Face ones they did there, but certainly the creation of Harley Quinn and all the little changes they did. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a good way to just kind of clarify that. You know, um, it's not all about what was in the comics necessarily. Uh, let's see, someone said Jean, Jimmy Olsen's white and, and James Gunn. Maybe I'm misremembering that. There are a couple of race swaps beside Perry White that he did, so maybe I'm just missing that one. Um, but thanks for the correction there, Fizzocho, or Fiz, Fizzchozo. I don't know why I want to say Fizzozo, Fizzozo, but the F corner. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not really good to call you either. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, so where was I? All right, so we like this, this we're tracing this example, this um, progression of Superman through the the uh, the ages and replying and, and responding in many ways to to culture. And, and what we need him to be. There, there's a really great quote, maybe I should say here. I think it was in my, I'm going go in my, I don't know if my Facebook memories are still up for today, because it's a picture that I share a lot. And I've shared it on this channel a lot, but I don't readily have access to it um, in a file right away here. So let me see if I can uh, find it on my memories here. Okay, I think it's there. I should be able to pull this up and share it. If, uh, yeah, there it is. This was a meme that I made that I, um, when I was doing my old Iconic Superman tab, if you listen to the uh, our Iconic Superman um, Facebook page, if you listen to my first episode of the Iconic Cast podcast from the other day, I actually did um, talk about this, the Iconic Superman page and everything, but this was one of the memes that I've made. And I'm sharing a quote, well, it's, Alan Schwartz, Alvin Schwartz originally said it, but this is paraphrased in a book by Tom DeHaven. It says, uh, spurious versions, fundamentally wrongheaded premises can and often do prevail from time to time. But eventually the character, Superman himself, Tulpa Superman, will somehow, somehow resist and reverse that meddling, reconstituting himself in the world as he means to be. And that is so very true, as we've seen throughout the the uh, the decades of the character, you know, the century of the character now, as we can say, I think, um, or close to it anyway, close to the century of it. Um, and so we'll see what's going to happen here in, in a minute in the in the future. But there are some some other factors at play. One of the reasons why we we respond well to certain archetypes at certain times in our culture and, and depending on what, what cyclical is going on in our history and whatnot is because archetypes inspire us to certain types of activity. And at certain times in culture, we need to be inspired to a certain type of activity, sometimes to another type of activity. And I've talked about, for example, you know, we're looking at Parag Superman there, for example, the Paragon, at times when we really need to kind of band together, be hopeful, really just strive for that better tomorrow. We should do that all the time, but really as a culture, as a whole, really trying to do that, you know, believing in one another and really trying to, to you know, uh, take that step together, the Paragons are important. Quite often at times in culture, the trickster is very important because the trickster blurs boundaries. Uh, whereas the Paragon transcends boundaries, the trickster blurs them. And the trickster is there. The trickster is not a creative force. It's funny because um, in a lot of ancient mythologies, trickster gods are creative in some way. But even in those stories, if you look at how that trickster creates, it's very rarely from any kind of intent 
to create from the trickster themselves. They're just out there blurring boundaries. They're out there tearing things down. They're out there doing things they shouldn't and and uh, breaking rules. But then as a result, because of that, things happen. Things are created or whatever. And that's the natural way of it. Uh, when we have, let's say, corruption in government, to, to any degree. I mean, you can go all the way back to the American Revolution, you know, so you can have corruption or things needed to be shaken up or blurred to the point of where there's a different uh, government itself that takes that takes over, a regime or whatever, or just simply, you know, uh, a sort of a reformation of sorts in a government body or whatever. It's because of the trickster. The trickster has to come in and question the things that we've held 100% true, the things that we've said, uh, you know, this is right, this is the way it is, we're not going to question that. The trickster comes in and tries to blur those boundaries a little bit and ask us, well, why do you really believe that? Is that really the way it should be? And the trickster forever appeals to that trickster spirit forever appeals to the young because the young are always growing up and, and, and needing to come to terms with the way the world is around them and then asking themselves as individuals and as a generation, are we OK with this or should we shake this up? Should we change this or are we OK with this? So the trickster always is, is appealing to the to the juvenile. I don't say that I mean in an in a insulting way. You know, it's, it's pretty natural to some degree. But there are forces in culture, individuals and, and bigger forces of society that can't break free of the trickster spirit. Like I said, the trickster doesn't create. The trickster calls out problems with things, tears things down, uh, in terms of rules and, and boundaries, blurs these things, you know, says no to this, no to this, no to this, no to this. But you have to move on from the trickster at some point if you're going to create anything in place of what you just tore down. You know, it's why a lot of political parties who are factions in political parties who do nothing but cry out against the the, the other party in power. We see this a lot. I mean, you see it, too, with factions of, of the Republican Party or the conservatives at times. But I think you really see it a lot more with factions of, of uh, certain liberal factions of the Democratic Party or certain just liberal groups or whatever, because they're really good at being the rebel. They kind of thrive in it. They kind of find their identity in being the, the rebel, the ones who are the liberal, not the conservative. I mean, it's in the it's in the language, right? The conservative is let's keep things how they are. That's what the word to conserve means. Whereas liberal means let's be free or let's break loose, let's break loose. You know, it's like, okay, well, you want to break loose. Okay, now you got power, you got your way. What are you going to do with it? How far are you going to go? What are you going to build up in, in place of it? And it's funny, every time a, a, um, a really liberal president comes into power, for example, there's this weird sort of adjustment phase. Sometimes it lasts longer than others. Like once that administration gets in power of like, okay, wait, now we made it. What are we going to do? <laughs> you know, we, we talked about what we want to do. Maybe you have a clear idea of what you want things to look like, but there's the, it's, it's always a little bit of a step. Anytime any pod, any individual or any body needs to move out of the trickster spirit into the um, into whatever other spirit they're going to use to create, whether it's a, it's a frontiersman, which is necessary. Uh, the frontiersman always has to come in after the trickster to protect those boundaries that have just been blurred, to protect the boundaries that have been expanded. You know, the frontiersman need to come in and remind you that there are still laws, there are still rules, there's still objective right and wrong that we need to abide by here. We ultimately need our paragons continuing to visit us every so often to make sure our standards don't slip. In the long run, we need our detective when things are shaken up so much that we need to be reminded that some, some boundaries should be restored. Maybe you, you broke everything down and some of that stuff had to go, but hey, some of that stuff was pretty good. And the detective comes in there and restores some of that stuff that's necessary and so forth. So all of these archetypes, you know, are, are necessary and they come in culture at, at certain times and we work from their spirit at different times. Last last week I talked about the uh, whatever you want to call them the fandom menace type movements on face on uh, YouTube or the the anti woke type movements on YouTube and you should go watch that if you didn't see it because it'll provide the context we're talking about now I too am very anti woke this nonsense and everything but as I pointed out. Uh, the, 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 they've, they've made a commodity out of the nerd outrage. They've made a commodity out of being anti-woke to the extent where they are, they're the tricksters now. A lot of these channels, a lot of these the people in this movement are the tricksters pointing out, hey, we've got to tear this down, tear this down, which is good, right? Yeah, let's tear down the woke Hollywood. 
aspects. Let's, you know, get rid of all this nonsense. But I think a lot of people in this movement and a lot of big uh, money-making entities in this movement have found themselves spinning their wheels within the tricksterness and they can't get out. Uh, they don't really want to get out. As I said before, what if, you know, what if things were fixed now? That'd be terrible for these channels. They'd, they'd stop making a lot of money, you know? They, they're, they're, they need that outrage. They need that, uh, that continuance of this. So I think, though, that because that trickster spirit is so appealing... It is appealing. It's fun to be the rebel, right? It is. It's just it's fun to be the rebel. It's fun to be the trickster. The tricksters uh, are charismatic. They they um they're fun to be a part of. And the fun thing about being a trickster or or uh, playing into the trickster spirit for any given time that we need to. The fun thing about that is that it doesn't matter. As I said, it doesn't matter what idea you have for what needs to replace it. You, a lot of people can come in with different ideas about ultimately what should replace this bad thing that's in our midst. But they can all come together and they can all unite under at least the shared purpose of we need to get rid of this bad thing in our midst. And that's good. It's good to have some unity there, sure. The problem, though, is that there's no... And this happens all the time with trickster... You know, this is think about, again, the American Revolution, for example to take it on a big political, you know, kind of a scheme. There was a there was a period of time where, oh my gosh, what are we going to put now in place of the British government? Okay, we're the United, you know, we're the, we're the colonies, we're Americans, now what are we going to be? And it took a while before the Articles of Confederation, you know, were, were done away with, and then, you know, the, the Constitution was a big deal to get that actually accepted and whatnot and, and have a clear vision of what we're going to build going forward. And then even from that moment, there were critics, and there should be. There should always be critics. That little, little bit of a trickster spirit should still always be there at the very least, and it needs to reassert itself somewhat every now and then, because uh, because we need, you know, we, we need to always ask those questions periodically. And I'm giving the government example, but even in something like uh, fighting against woke Hollywood, okay, well, what do you want to replace it? There's no one consensus. And so... The problem is, like, take a case like Superman, for example. We need a return to the true, iconic Superman, not just the character, not just somebody who goes out and saves, because if that was the case, then Superman Returns would be fine. There'd be nothing wrong with Superman Returns. But we need the universe around him in that fiction to be as iconic as well. We, we need to stop making these little concessions. Well, you know, that character isn't really what they should be, and this and that, but hey, at least at least we've got, you know, this. Um, you know, Lois might be a total biatch and be, you know, sort of cucking Superman at every angle, but hey, at least at least Tyler Hecklin is, is he really looks good in the suit, and he's doing things, and he's saving the day, and, you know, um, it, you know that's just the beginning of some of the little problems there. So there's no clear consensus on, on what we need to replace it with so the 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 fight for it the opposition to what's currently at place very quickly falls off very quickly falls off as i've described it before hollywood throws you a bone and suddenly the 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 united masses fighting against this thing disperse or fight over themselves about the bone or whatever and they they don't continue like there's a you know, there's a feast being held, and, and, you know, Disney's keeping the feast from you, and they throw out a chicken leg, and, and some people are like, well, you know, at least they threw out a chicken leg. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, so what, what do you do with that? I, I think we need, I don't think that the, the calling out the problems need to stop. I do think that preying on people and making a commodity out of their nerd rage, trying to monetize their their outrage and keep it going for the sake of monetization needs to stop. And I think people are waking up. They are waking up. I used to say this a lot about those channels and, and the, the initial feedback or the initial response was, how dare you? They're getting the message out. It was really interesting to see the response of last week, me pointing it out again, because especially pointing out the specific methods that a lot of these channels use and whatnot, the, the best responses I could get, well, hey, at least it's, at least it's a, place we can go to not get woke stuff you know or be called names or like that that's that's what you got that's your that's your defense of it now you know so it's it's slowly starting to to um crumble a little bit there but we also need to to really focus on more replacing of the things that hollywood 
isn't giving us. And yeah, unfortunately for a while, that means not being able to have stories from these franchises. You know, they still have the copyrights to Superman and to Star Wars and so forth. Uh, but we can go out to these indie creators or to other places that are that are completely devoid of all that nonsense you know they're, they're not going to be well you know here's the game you compromise this you give us the the gay bi trans you know amputee whatever uh <laughs> you know jimmy olsen here and uh and then we'll give you a superman who saves the day over here or whatever you know and and and, and, and as I said, the problem with that is just this one little concession on, on, an, on an agenda. So maybe that concession isn't such a big deal, whatever it is, but it's one little tick more on the agenda. You're dealing with people that are trying to take the thing away from you. So you're, you're, you're negotiating with terrorists, so to speak. You know, you're, They're saying, well, well, we'll keep this thing alive for a little while that you want because, you know, you're going to give us these other things. You're going to give us the money in the suitcase or whatever, you know. Uh, you can't trust them. So we need to replace them. And, and sometimes that's going to mean, okay, we need to bring up about paragons, aspirational paragons that we can look to instead of Superman for a time. And, and they'll notice that and they'll get, they'll get panicked a little bit and they'll try to give you a little bit more of what you want, but not everything that you want. And they'll start playing the game with you to the point where you're like, well, you know, I mean, that's, it's good enough. That's all I really need. You know, and is it, is it really all you need? Because the culture didn't used to be like this. And, and a lot of people can can kind of forget that, but these characters, as I said, for all the changes that were made to to Superman or Spider Man or He Man or or whatever, they still retain their iconic core. The, the, even the universe around them, their 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 worlds retain the iconic core. And when missteps were made, they quickly they quickly fell off. You know, no one really worried about that or or wanted to keep that around. Now we're dealing with a Hollywood who doesn't care about your feedback. And in many ways, they don't even care much about your money. They care about getting the message out. They care about your attention. And so few people can stay the course and not give them that attention. So few people can look away for any extended period of time. But, oh, but, oh, but I saw something really cool over there. I gotta go check that out. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go see that once. Okay, look, yeah, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, but that's it for me. That's it for me. Until, oh, what's that other thing that looks pretty good? Yeah, you know, I mean, they, they can't. And I'm not saying you need to never go see a movie again. I'm just saying be true and be, you know, uh, sincere to the values here. Uh, my dear Sound Engraver for a super chat. Thank you so much there. So this those concessions that brought in the Vespas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. That was a great part of the Cyberfrog story. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. All right. So um, there might be some other topics or points um, to bring up about that. If I think of them, I will. But I'll pop into the chat here and see what you guys are talking about. Uh, Malwinus Cyrano says, uh, tricksters are not rebels. Aren't they more streaming for personal enjoyment or goals? The individual character, uh, what well, depends on what kind of trickster you're talking about. If you're talking about like the ancient trickster gods, eh, it depends still. I mean, they're rebelling against norms, you know, they're, they're, um, for their personal goals, I'm thinking about like Native American tricksters, or uh, or even the you know the original Norse Norse Loki god. There's a great quote. Uh, I think it's from Neil Gaiman in his book on Norse gods and Norse mythology. He says that was the thing about Loki. You appreciated him when you hated him the most, and you hated him the most when you appreciated him. You know the idea that he would. Uh, even when he was really trying to like straight up hurt you or straight up kill you, he would end up granting you the, the biggest boon that he could. You know, and that's the nature of tricksters. Uh, but regardless, the trickster spirit is very much a rebel, you know. Um, and these are big terms that we're using, too. So we're kind of talking about, um, you know, we can talk about the trickster as a hero. We can talk about the trickster as a villain. There are certain different rules that apply. Uh, trickster as a god and so forth. Nathaniel's Lowsball says, you notice these days that they always refer to the He-Man franchise as just Masters of the Universe and not He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Oh, exactly. That's a very subtle little dig 
because we we can't we can't have the focus on this blonde you know white heteronormative guy no it's it's all of them it's all of them and then they'll they'll try to gaslight you hey it's always been about all of them it's always been masters of the universe and everyone's important and tila's just as much of a hero as he meant no no shut up stop it that's not true at all Fizzoso Corner says, "What about the antihero?" And that's a great. That's a great. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I did a video on the antihero. Now I don't know if it's still up or not. I think I wanted to flesh it out a little bit more. But yeah, antiheroes are very important too. Uh, to some degree, they can serve. They, they they can kind of cross over a little bit in terms of purpose with the trickster, because the antihero says, "What's um." what's right and what's wrong in this situation, you know? Uh, so the Punisher, Deadpool, even the Incredible Hulk sometimes, you know, can be seen as an anti-hero. And there's also an element of catharsis that we live out through the Punisher. Like, the, the answer in real life is never to just go out and slaughter the mobs and, sla- and you know, you know, bomb, you know, this part of New York or whatever, you know. But the Punisher can do those, that kind of thing in stories. You know, he can he can dismember and torture a pedophile, you know, and whatever, you know, just whatever. And it's, it's, it's as you watch that, it, it's like a catharsis for the viewers. It's like you get to, you get to feel that, uh, that sense of justice being applied to a great evil. But real world wouldn't work like that if we had everybody going around trying to apply that kind of justice, you know, and stuff and be and not not be subjective to any kind of one rule as a society, then, you know, you'd have the Wild West. So, uh, you know, and that, that's not a political statement. That's just saying, you know, yeah, everybody can't just do whatever they think is right in their heart and pull out a gun and a knife and enforce it, you know. Uh, thank you, drive by commenter. Ten dollars. Appreciate that. Say, all in all, it's still a byproduct of social media itself and the algorithm chase. When people had more time to process what they consumed, there was more emphasis on scripted media well, being well told. You know, that's a good point you bring up. The, the culture itself, the culture of, um, I'm going to use this word, I hate this word, but the culture of media consumption, or the nature of it, certainly has changed. It has turned into more consumption, as you're saying, because people need a quick fix. They They can't just sit down and watch a show you know i've talked about this before but it's so annoying it's so aggravating it's so infuriating quite frankly when i was in school when i was a student if the student wheel if the teacher wheeled in the big you know tv or or, you know put on the the projection or whatever you know to to watch a movie it was like yes cool you know no lecture day we're actually gonna get to watch a movie or something nowadays like when i do teach in person and if I want to show a movie or clips of a movie or whatever to talk about the hero's archetype, you can almost hear the audible groan from students like, oh, and I'm like, well, what, what is that about? It's because they are going to ask they're You're going to ask them to sit there and focus on a film and their attention is going to have to stay there focused on a film for an hour or two hours, whatever it is. Immediately, everybody has to get up and use the bathroom like they can't handle that. Their brains have been damaged to the point where a TikTok video is all they've got. That's all they've got in them at that point. Uh, I even think a lot of young people who might still try to watch films or, let's say, Netflix binge series or whatever, how many times do they have to pause it? How many times are they looking at their phone while they're watching whatever they're supposedly watching? People just can't, their brains have lost the ability to sit and focus on one thing and and really process, as you say, process what they consumed. Um, think about it, you know, that's that's so important. And it's a, it, I, I really think if culture is to be saved at all, and I'm so glad you mentioned that too, Drive-By Commenter, I'm glad you uh, brought this up and threw this out here as, a, as another angle of the discussion, because it's so true. I think if culture is to be saved at all, we need people who can, who need to relearn how to how to partake of story. They need to relearn how to do that. It's not enough just to listen to your audio book on like, you know, five times the speed or whatever so you can hurry up and get through the story or whatever. It's not enough to uh, binge that show while you're also answering some emails or hate scrolling, you know, <laughs> something on, on this or that. No, stop it. If something's worth watching, then sit down and watch it. Practice. And and it might be little baby steps. Maybe that's all some people can do. Some people can, I'm going to give this a half hour. Okay, I'm going to set my phone over there 
for one half hour and just do nothing but watch this thing, you know? Take the baby steps you need. You know, I've told people about reading. Yeah, it's good. The goal is to eventually sit down to where you can sit there and read for an hour, two hours, whatever, and not be uh, interrupted, you know, as your schedule will allow. I know sometimes, you know, I, I rarely have a full hour. I can just sit and read and do nothing else. But, um, but you know, your brain needs to be capable of doing that. And it's so important for people to build up their stamina again. Um, now, AL, AL brings up a good point, except video games. They can, they can spend hours on video games. Yeah, but, and you're right, but look at the types of video games they spend hours on. You know, something like Fortnite or, uh, or Roblox or whatever, these are, these are almost like the TikTok of video games, you know? Uh, think of a game where there's just a really solid story. It's story-heavy, and you're going to walk through. I mean, I, I think we're entering the time where I don't even know if a game like Witcher 3, which isn't all that long ago, right? I don't even know if games like that are going to continue in any kind of way because you have to build on the story. You actually have to sit there and listen to the dialogue, watch the scenes, process what's going on before you move on and do the quest, you know? Um, I think those games are probably going to fall by the wayside for a while, sadly. I, I really hope that, uh, that, that you know, we, we can make some change and we can get some people coming around on that definitely uh, what else is going on here in the chat Leia plus size says I have no problems with the anti-hero but I think they are making too many of them turning everybody into an anti-hero oh absolutely absolutely yeah um, that's a big problem everybody wants to make Batman into an anti-hero which no he's never supposed to be an anti-hero he never was supposed to be an anti-hero you've got your Punishers you've got your Deadpools you've got your, your anti-heroes out there they're, they're good enough. They're enough. They're, they're important. They do serve an important role, but stop trying to remake every hero into one, you know? And again, that's from that, that, that's when you see, when you try to see all the archetypes through the lens of the trickster in terms of the spirit of culture, trying to say, yeah, but should they really follow that rule or should they really, does Batman really need to not kill, you know, and, and going into that. So yeah, definitely. Andre Hernandez, thank you so much for the $20 super chat. That is very generous of you and very much appreciated. Definitely appreciate that. Thank you. Say, so can you really blame people for thinking Superman is a hard character to write? If you write him perfect, then he is bland, one-dimensional character. If you write him having flaws, then is he really Superman? This is the conundrum that a lot of people fall into. And I'm glad you wrote it out there, and I'm glad you worded it just like you did. It's actually not... He's not bland at all when he's written as he's supposed to be. He can still face challenges. Superman can very much still face challenges. He can just never doubt that there is a right way out of this. There's always a, uh, a, there's always a better choice, and there's always a right way out of this. You can't put him in a situation like where um, people were trying to, t to defend his killing Zod at the end of Super uh, Man of Steel, saying, look, he... What could he do? It was an interesting situation. He didn't want to kill him, but he had to. If he's going to save that family, he had to snap Zod's neck. First of all, that's not true. There are at least two or three other things he could have done with Zod than kill him. But if you're trying to tell a story where Superman or Batman or another you know, aspirational hero can't do anything but, then you're telling the wrong type of story for that character archetype. You shouldn't be using that archetype. That's not their, that, That's not that character's job. To, to fit into that type of story. You don't want a Sophie's Choice, an aspirational hero. That's ridiculous. Um, the aspirational hero story would, would, would come up with another way that you hadn't thought of. And is that realistic to real life all the time? No, of course not. But that's the work that the aspirational hero stories do for us, the work that Superman does for us. So, I mean, you bring up a good point there, Andre Hernandez, but, but um, I would say that it's easy to write Superman when you understand when some of these writers should understand how he's, you can have challenges. Uh, one of the cool things about the Superman Returns video game, which is actually really good, it tells a story on its own that kind of, you know, sort of fits in with the movie, but not really. And there's so many great things. But in that game, you lose points if you create damage to Metropolis or the people. If you create too much, you know, collateral damage, you know, you're there to save the people, not hurt them. And, and you, you know, you fail the game <clears throat> if you're not out there. So like, uh, was it Metallo? Somebody's like stomping around the streets, you know, in one scene. And if you're not saving enough people, if you allow him to hurt enough people, then you've lost the game. 
because that's what Superman should do is save the people. So if you're going to try to be Superman this game, you need to save the people. And if you don't, then you lost the game. There's no story to be told. There's no Superman story to be told where he lets a bunch of people die, you know, because that's not the right story for that hero. So I love that aspect about that game, even though the game hard, you know, the gameplay can be a little hard here and there. But uh, that was fun. But great point there. I appreciate you mentioning that comment and appreciate the, the super chat. Uh, drive by commenter for another ten dollars. Thank you again. Said I would add to this: the real final boss goes back to when Zuckerberg and co-creator warned about the effects of Facebook, but forged ahead. Now we have the same hand waving with the data human heist of AI. You know, it's a big topic, and you're bringing up a lot of great points. I think about this a lot because I am a crazy introvert. I've never met a human being who was more introverted than myself. Never. And a lot of people say they're introverts. I was so lucky to find my dear wife, Sound Engraver, who's uh, very introverted in a lot of ways, but I've never met my match when it comes to introversion. Like somebody, I mean, Sound Engraver's my match, but I mean, you know, somebody who could match me for introversion. Uh, and it, it wouldn't be good anyway. We'd just not talk to each other. But because of that, I some of the technology that exists today for me personally is kind of like, Oh, where have you been all my life? You know, <laughs> you mean I could have just been in my room and still been able to get some socialization in, but not actually have to go out and see everybody. That's amazing. I'd love that as a teenager, you know? Um, you know, so, so a lot of it is kind of like, I love the technology. I love the, the video games. I love this and that, but I would trade it all. I would trade it all. If, if we could undo the harm it's done, to our brains and to culture, to people's attention spans. I mean, really, give me a stack of comic books and my stereo. I don't need Wi-Fi. I'll be fine, you know? Um, and I don't say that lightly because I love my Wi-Fi. I love my video games. I love my Internet, you know? But it, it has, it. man, these, these social media things I've heard. It's just, and it came upon us so quickly, so quickly. I don't think we've seen a technological advancement Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we've had a technological advancement affect culture this hard. Uh, really just stop the growth of culture. I've done videos before where you can go decade by decade and see a lot of specific styles and specific things. But once the smartphone became in everybody's pocket, culture just sort of grinded to a halt. And we don't really see that many different things, um, you know, flavors and stuff coming up from decade to decade. So it's a big topic. It's an important one. I appreciate you bringing up those aspects of it. All right, I'm going to uh, wrap up here. Um, Malwin has said, did it, uh, which is an interesting comment because uh, I've been meaning to do this. Have you, did you ever look at Judge Dredd as he is basically a hero but subverted it uh, is a satire of the hero concept? You know, I, I'm ashamed to admit this, and you guys can geek shame me here if you want. I've never read Judge Dredd, and I've never seen any of the movies for Judge Dredd. It's just something I missed. It's just one of those things you, you just slips by you and you never get back onto it or whatever. So I would like to. I would like to, especially from what you're saying there about it. Definitely will check it out. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> Ghost Planet talking about Duck Dodgers. Yeah, it's a parody of Buck Rogers. Yeah, I did watch that. That was good stuff. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I think my voice is going a little bit. You know me. I'm about an hour streaming. That's it. Sound Engraver was telling me today because uh, she has the time. I'm usually with my daughter uh, tending to her on days that um, RJ from the Fourth Age streams. And uh, Sound Engraver is able to actually sit there and, and watch him uh, more fully. But she says he goes about an hour, too. <laughs> and uh, this chat gives him so I'm, At least I'm not alone. Uh, the last Dread film is fantastic. I know they did a remake of it or something. So, yeah, uh, it, it has been something on my list. It has existed on my list, but um, but I definitely should check it out. I should bump it up a little bit from what you guys are saying. Don't want to miss the most re recent movie, Dread. Tom Spiegel chimes in. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a definite to do. Like I said, that's something that was really on my list anyway. So uh, maybe I'll watch it this spring break. Maybe. Maybe I'll be able to tell you guys next week what I thought of it. We'll see. I don't know. All right, so what's coming up? <clears throat> uh, I've got some more standalone videos. I, I've got some more comic analyses to do. I'm waiting on my omnibus of She uh, from Billy Tucci to come in, which I'm pretty excited about. I'm waiting on my uh, Ghost of Matacumbe Key from Graham Nolan, the Nolanverse there to come in, Compass Comics, which will be good to, to do. Um, what else is coming in? 
soon. I know that the the graveyard shift stuff will ship later. Uh, I'm I'm always looking for some new comics, some new indie comic stuff like that to to analyze and do some literary analysis of. But it has to be, it really does have to be something that I can really dig into. Um, and while I applaud everybody who tries to put a story out there whether it's a film, whether it's animation, whether it's a comic, whether it's a book or whatever. I do think we should be we should we should start being a little pickier about the quality of stories we really recommend to each other. And that's not to discourage people from creating and, and new creators from trying to get their stuff out there. It's to encourage them rather to to really do the work, put in the work and get better and get as best as good as you can. Um, you're always going to be able to get better, but, but try to, try to really achieve that professional threshold as, as quickly as possible, you know, and it takes time, you know? So, uh, I don't know. That's a whole other topic I can get into. Sound engraver. Yes. I was not going to forget, but thank you for the $2 anyway. <laughs> her stream is up for tomorrow. She'll be streaming. I think like 5:45 ish is her usual time unless she's changed it. So, uh, that stream's coming tomorrow. Got more stuff coming there. Oh, another $10 super chat from Andre Hernandez. As an introvert, do you like teaching in person and have to public speak? Are teaching online with a bunch of black boxes, but at the comfort of your own home. Well, I do teach online predominantly now, and I love it, but it's never bothered me. As an introvert, even as somebody with social anxiety, I have no problem. I can stand up in front of a thousand people and give a talk. No problem whatsoever, because I have an assigned role. I'm not talking back and forth. We're not chit-chatting. There's no small talk. They're not stealing my energy, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's just me. I'm in my role. I'm giving my talk. Now, after that's done, let me exit the stage and get the crap out of there <laughs> when it comes to having to mingle or answer some questions or whatever. Or, oh, there's a cocktail hour. Like, pass, hard pass. <laughs> but uh, that's just me. Like I said, I've never met anybody as introverted as myself. But, uh, you know, people have all different flavors on the spectrum. It's all good. All right. So um, I do like Wild West comics there. William Turnbull, Blueberry comic. Never heard of that. I'll look it up. Thank you guys for hanging out. As usual, I'll be back next week, and I'll have some standalone videos, hopefully some more of those comic analyses and uh, and things dropping. But um, I'll try and do some more stuff this week since I've got the time. But uh, thank you guys. Until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the true blue hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.